Hello everyone, Dr. Alex Vasquez here, and I apologize in advance for the bit of echo that's present in this room, which is a relatively new office for me. Let's take a look at this case. This is a patient with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, idiopathic neuropathy, and rosacea. He's in his mid-50s and is a healthcare professional who had to go on disability due to severity of fatigue, pain, and neuropathy. No gastrointestinal symptoms, but stool testing showed plus three Aromonas hydrophila, also Citrobacter, Klebsiella, and another Citrobacter. Low beneficial bacteria, and the patient has already been treated with diet, mitochondrial support, and nutrient support. So the question that was posed to me and the group is what would we do in terms of herbs and or antibiotics? So let's take a quick look at all the information that we have. We see low diversity here. No surprise because that's that basically sets the stage for bad dysbiosis and this patient has bad dysbiosis. When we look at the gastrointestinal microbiome as reported here, we see no growth on lactobacillus and then again we see the Citrobacter, Klebsiella and another Citrobacter along with Aromonas hydrophila which I consider to be a bad bug as we might say. So I'd like to get rid of that Aromonas hydrophila for sure. If we can wipe out the Klebsiella, Citrobacter and the other Citrobacter then I think that would be to the patient's advantage as well. So again low diversity, major bacterial dysbiosis with some bad gram-negative bacteria. When we look at more details here, we see that the patient has low, but at least present, fecal bacterium prausnitzii. We notice that the acromantia is actually high. Acromantia can be anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory. So we're not exactly in a good situation to have a lot of acromantia municifilla in this case, and we would definitely like to see an increase in the Fecalobacterium prausnitzii. No ova or parasites are seen, and with digestion and absorption, things look pretty good. When we look at inflammation and immunology, we notice that the calprotectin is low. The eosinophil protein X is also undetectable, as is the secretory IgA, and that is not only undetectable, but it's also unacceptable. So we need to see some immune or inflammatory response in this patient. Right now, this patient looks like he is a bit immune suppressed. We also see at the bottom of the page that the beta-glucuronidase is also quite high. So this patient is definitely entitled to feel miserable. This patient is probably not going to be able to get out of this situation without some pretty assertive help and I would recommend antibiotic drugs. Based on these results we're looking at uh, sensitivity and culture results here. Citrobacter is sensitive to Cipro which we're going to ignore. Uh, we'll give a point to tetracycline and we'll give a point to Bactrim and then we'll look down at some natural products such as berberine and the plant tannins. Again, what we noted previously is that this patient's immune inflammatory response is virtually absent and that's obviously a major problem here. For the culture and sensitivity results on Citrobacter jungiae, we see sensitivity for Cipro. We're going to ignore that again. Tetracycline gets another point as does Bactrim. For the Aromonas hydrophila, ceftriaxone is sensitive here. I love ceftriaxone. I don't like gentamicin too much. We're going to ignore again the Cipro and we'll give another point to Bactrim. And here for the Klebsiella, we see sensitivity for Cipro, also amoxicillin, clavulonic acid, also known as Augmentin, and again, tetracycline, and again, Bactrim. So I think Bactrim walks away with the most points in this case. So I'll review that appropriately on this page. So our summary is this patient is debilitated with various different problems that likely originate from the gut. He's got major bacterial dysbiosis with at least four pathogens or potential pathogens. So again, I would ignore the Cipro. We could easily consider tetracycline. I would probably lean toward Bactrim in this case. Ceftriaxone is a drug that I really love. I learned to love it when I was in medical school, but it's by injection only. And in this case, I don't really see that as being relevant here. Augmentin is also a consideration here. Natural products, berberine, oregano, and tannins. He needs some immune support because he doesn't have any significant immune or inflammatory response. So here's how I would take a look at this case. I'd say the patient has the option to use herbs 
uh, for two to four weeks if he wants. I would tend to go directly to antibiotics. Always check for drug allergies and interactions. I would go with Bactrim in this case for obvious reasons. It's a really nice drug for one thing. It gets good tissue penetration. He might have dysbiosis in other locations. Bactrim is used for everything ranging from sinus infections to severe pneumonia to acne. And I'd say let's go for it if this patient does not have any contraindication. We could very reasonably add berberine here. I would also add Saccharomyces boulardii, 250 milligrams three times a day. Other probiotics, of course. Glutamine, 30, 30 grams a day. Vitamin A, 50,000 international units per day. Vitamin D, 10,000 international units per day. Zinc, 50 milligrams per day. And whey protein, uh, assuming that he's not outrageously so-called allergic to dairy products, 30 to 60 grams per day. He needs to consume a lot of fiber and seeds to keep his guts moving. If he wants to promote that process a bit more, or if he flares or wants to avoid flaring, then a morning top to bottom lavage with 20 to 40 grams of vitamin C in one liter of water, we would simply be using that as an osmotic laxative, followed by two cups of coffee as a bowel stimulant. So we're giving uh, a generous dose of water in the context of an os osmotic laxative with a bowel stimulant, in this case coffee. Later in the day, he could have some salted foods, fruit juice, vegetable juice to replace electrolytes. Check, of course, for any contraindications such as arrhythmia, renal insufficiency, and in the case of the vitamin C iron overload. So, in very quick summary, that provides you an overview of how I would be inclined to treat this case based on the outline provided and the few labs that we have here. I'm going to take a moment to add a few final considerations to my quick review of this case. Does this patient need a test for leaky gut? In my opinion, absolutely not. We can presume he has it, uh, and I think that this is generally irrelevant for the management of this case. Possibly we might use the lactulose mannitol assay if we're trying to monitor response to treatment, if the patient is particularly interested, but certainly not motivated by clinician profit. Does this patient need a test for SIBO via breath gas testing? Again, no. I think that clinical evaluation is obviously immediate. And I think most of us know how to assess SIBO clinically at this point. Does this patient need laboratory testing for nutritional supplementation? Again, no. We can use glutamine, vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc, omega-3 fatty acids, coenzyme Q10. All of these can be administered empirically. And I think we might add some vitamin B12, considering the fact that he has this gastrointestinal dysbiosis, which is known to predispose toward B12 deficiency. And one of this patient's presenting complaints is neuropathy. Another is fatigue. And both of those can be related to vitamin B12 deficiency. I've already discussed this in the video program on microbiome and dysbiosis. So what I'm going to do is add that excerpt where I discuss in video format vitamin B12 as related to dysbiosis. I'm simply going to attach that video to the end of this video when I process it for the second time. We, of course, have to talk about risk-benefit considerations. A lot of times the conversation on risk-benefit is kind of focused in on individual treatments. In this case, the only treatment that we discuss that really needs a risk-benefit conversation is antibiotics. But another aspect of risk-benefit conversations is not simply to look at the risk-benefit ratio of individual treatments, but also to look, as we might say, perhaps more holistically at the clinical situation, what is the risk and benefit ratio of either treating or not treating this patient? I think that that's very compelling, and especially in this case. So with antibiotics, for example, we can classify antibiotic reactions as being rather mild, such as yeast overgrowth, for example. We can address that with nystatin, berberine, oregano, and probiotics. More serious adverse effects due to antibiotic administration, of course, include Clostridium difficile. We can help prevent that with probiotic supplementation as well. And the very serious antibiotic reactions that we don't see very commonly, but when they do occur, they are, of course, devastating. These include Steven Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, acute tubular necrosis, and acute interstitial nephritis as well. 
Again, what is the risk of not treating this patient with antibiotics? The major risk, of course, is that this patient's going to suffer with these conditions for the rest of his life, and he's already debilitated. So I think we have an obligation to take effective action. Again, this has been a very informal or impromptu review. I invite you to take a look at some of my more refined videos, which you'll find available on the internet. And you can see here, ichnfm.org forward slash CME provides you a few samples of my more developed videos. So thank you very much for taking a look at this case. I think it's a very interesting case. I think it's very classic. I think this is a phenotype that we do see in clinical practice, what we might call dysbiosis-induced neuropathy, obviously a segue from dysbiosis-induced chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So again, thank you, and please take a look at some of my other videos if you are interested in this topic of microbiome dysbiosis and functional medicine in general. Small intestine bacterial overgrowth is rather famous for causing nutrient malabsorption. One of the nutrients that's rather sensitive or vulnerable to that malabsorption is vitamin B12. So patients can have neuropsychiatric consequences due to nutrient malabsorption, especially B12 malabsorption and B12 deficiency that was primarily caused by gastrointestinal dysbiosis specifically small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And we know that vitamin B12 deficiency can have massive neuropsychiatric consequences, everything from fatigue to depression to anxiety to mania to schizophrenia type phenotypes, as well as bipolar disorder and catatonia. Number 14 on our list takes a positive turn. We know that microbes in the gut produce butyrate and that butyrate has many anti-inflammatory and mitochondrial benefits. Also, good bacteria, like the probiotic type bacteria in the gut, stimulate the vagus nerve to provide a brain-specific as well as a systemic anti-inflammatory effect.